just want to let you know that if, uh, because true or false answers, there's 50% that if you guess, you will be right, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in order to account for that, if you give a wrong answer, you get, you lose a point, okay? That's normal, that's, you know, with true and false questions, because you're gonna, you know, you can get a very reasonable course score just you know, by guessing, so. Um, so if, if you really don't know an answer, don't answer it, you know, don't guess it. Well, the last question, just to make sure everybody, uh, there's no confusion here. If you decide that this is the picture of a plate product, you, you do like this, okay? That's just a clear arrow from the name to the, the, the picture of the product. That's all I want.
All right, 30 seconds left. If you don't, please uh, um, put it here in the front. 20 seconds and just if you don't, pl please bring it, bring it here as soon as you're done. <laughs> Five seconds, okay. Everybody hand in their uh, paperwork now, please. You can give it to your friend who's gonna bring it here, just uh, work it out, but uh, bring it, uh, please, get it there. Excuse me? Oh, yeah, department is, uh, if you're in material science, just write material science. If you're in one of the uh, GIFT labs, write uh, CSL, uh, so, or you know, if you're from an, another you're chemical engineering, uh, so I, I kind of have an idea. Good. Um, and on Monday, I was, um, I thought about, after the class, I thought a little bit about something I said. Um, uh, in during the course, and I, I think I was a little bit unclear about um, the following. You remember I said you have these slabs which are about 10 meters long and 25 millimeter, uh, 250 millimeters, 25 centimeters thick that are being processed and turned into a uh, strip. <coughs> and typically, um, if it's a flat rolled product, uh, it's about five millimeters in thickness. The product doesn't get any width change, so that means that you, come, you start with something that's 10 meter in length and end up with something that's 500 meter in length, yes? And of course, the production unit, um, you don't accumulate any material inside, so you must have a constant mass flow through the, the production unit. Huh? So that means that the, the volume times the section uh, is a constant. So, so if I have a, a 10 meter long uh, 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 slab with a thickness of 250 millimeters and a certain width, and the product comes out with the same width but only five millimeters in thickness, the velocity is much higher, right? So, and that means that uh, there is an acceleration of the process as you, uh, as, as you, as you make this, uh, this uh, hot strip. And because it's so long, obviously, uh, it's very difficult to store uh, something that's 500 uh, meter long. And eventually, when it's cold roll, will end up being a couple of kilometers long. Uh, you coil it, right? That makes it uh, very convenient to pack, you know, to, to uh, um, uh, to um, uh, carry it around. Hmm? Okay, so um, so much for that um, uh, correction to, to something I said last, uh, during the last lecture. So let's go um, uh, pick up where we left on uh, Monday. Um, we were talking about uh, steels and, and the, the composition of steels. Hmm? And, uh, and I, was, I was telling you that uh, when you first see uh, or you're first confronted with the composition of skill, you have the impression that half of, or all the elements of the periodic table seem to be in that uh, necessary to make a steel. It's not true. There are lots of elements um, in, in compositions that you will get from skill, but um, they all have their function. So these are the, the most common the elements that you'll find in steels. Um, and um, I already told you that there were some elements that, that were what we say ubiquitous. You know, you cannot avoid them because elements such as manganese are, and silicon are reduced at the same time as iron in the blast furnace. So you end up having a base concentration of these elements. Carbon, of course, the same thing. It originally comes from the fact that you have uh, you're reducing your iron um, uh, ore with, with carbon. The aluminum from the, um, uh, the, the oxidation of the, the steel, for when you do the aluminum killing, 
the calcium, when you do the calcium treatment to remove sulfur, etc. Uh, of yeah, so th these elements will be present. Um, and then there, there are elements which are impurities, yes, and um, they're, they're shown here. Impurities, which we commonly refer to as tramp elements. Um, some of them come from the steel making, iron making or steel making, such as phosphorus and sulfur. Other elements come from uh, the use of scrap, and I, uh, I said that uh, copper was one of them. Of them. Uh, uh, that comes, for instance, from uh, uh, yeah, wiring. Uh, uh, tin comes from uh, having cans in your um, scrap, for instance. And hydrogen comes from moisture in the air that gets picked up by the liquid metal. Hmm? Um, so we don't really want them, they're unwanted. Very often we analyze for them in the industry because they, uh, you know, you want to make sure uh, you're not contaminating your steel with, for instance, too high a level of, of copper. And, all right. Um, but um, you have uh, basic alloying elements uh, to steel. So, and of course, some of these elements we've talked about uh, reappear here. Uh, uh, Carbon is, is ubiquitous in the steel composition, but it's also an element that we will add to steel and control the level of because it's very much related to the mechanical properties of your steel. And the same goes for uh, manganese and silicon. Okay. Oops, I'm going the wrong way here. Excuse me. Right. Um, there are elements which we add to control the transformation. You remember we have a high temperature uh, form of iron uh, which we call austenite and a low temperature one which we call ferrite. This transformation is very important to generate a very wide variety of microstructures in steels and there are elements which we call hardening elements, yes, which uh, allow us to slow down this transformation. Hmm? And the most important ones are boron, uh, nickel, manganese, chrome, and moly. Hmm? Then, and I'll, I'll say a few words about these in a moment, but um, then you have special additions. Hmm? Uh, for instance, uh, when we want to make a high strength steels but not obtain the high strengths through carbon. We'll, we'll see uh, uh, soon that one of the ways you can increase the strength of carbon, of, of a steel, excuse me, is to add carbon. Very uh, cost effective way of doing it. Um, there are problems uh, related to this uh, approach, one of them being weldability. So uh, you can increase the strength of steels by micro-alloying uh, with these carbide formers, titanium, vanadium, and niobium. Hmm? So we call them, because we add very little of these uh, elements, we call them micro-alloying additions. For tool steels, yes, we add, we also add uh, carbide formers, yes, um, and they're shown here. Chromium, molybdenum, and tungstens are typical additions that we make to steels which are used to produce tools. And the very simple reason is because they form very hard carbides. Um, Cobalt is also added to tool steels, not because it forms uh, uh, carbide, but because it, it has an impact on the, the general microstructure, and we'll talk about this when we come to tool steels. Uh, copper is an element we uh, already mentioned, and we said we didn't like copper. Well, it turns out that uh, if certain alloys, special steels, we will actually add copper. Hmm? We will add copper, for instance, because it can give us precipitation hardening effects. Yes. 
And uh, there are certain constructional steels, which we will uh, talk about in the, the course of the lectures, where you add a little bit of copper to uh, give you a uh, weathering resistance corrosion layer. Yeah? And that basically protects the steel against atmospheric corrosion. Um, the phosphorus, yes, which is an element I already mentioned, saying, well, we don't really like this element. It has a negative impact on the toughness of the material. We will see, however, that uh, just like copper, it, can, it gives you very efficient strengthening. Very efficient strengthening. So in certain cases, we do add phosphorus. Yes? We add just enough to have very good uh, what's called solid solution strengthening without impact, ne a negative impact on toughness. Sulfur and lead uh, would be elements um, that uh, you wouldn't want in steels in general unless we're talking about machining steels. These are steels that you, uh, uh, when you want to make a part out of this uh, steel, you need to machine them. For instance, uh, crankshafts motor of motors, they need to be machined, and many other parts, uh, gears, for instance, need to be machined. So uh, in order to facilitate machining, we add lead. We used to add a lot of lead. Nowadays, we add uh, sulfides, and so we need to have an increased sulfur lead level. The reason why we don't like lead is because of environmental concerns. Yes. Yep. Uh, there are uh, special steels, again, uh, such as uh, maraging steels. Maraging steels are very interesting steels. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about them, very special class of uh, uh, formable martensitic steels. Um, and they use cobalt. Cobalt is a very expensive alloying element. So it's, it's very uncommon to see cobalt in steels. So, uh, but you will see them in maraging steel applications and in tool steel applications. You're all familiar with the stainless steels. Fundamental in the, uh, the stainless steels are chromium and uh, molybdenum when we talk about uh, ferritic stainless steels, which have a, a BCC, a ferritic uh, microstructure. Um, you also have a class of stainless steels which are called, which are osmotic, which have an FCC uh, uh, crystal structure at room temperature. And uh, they will contain, in addition to chrome and moly, nickel and nitrogen. Um, just for your information, of course, you know that chromium uh, gives, is responsible for the corrosion resistance of, uh, of stainless steels. So, is, so, so does uh, molybdenum. Uh, it gives the uh, stainless steel very good corrosion resistance and nitrogen, too. If you're wondering why these elements are used, mainly for their corrosion resistance. And the nickel in order to stabilize the austenite uh, structure. Okay. So... We've added these elements to our steel. Our steel gets cast. We know that uh, some of these elements will be um, substitutional or interstitial, so they will be in solution, yes? Mm -hmm. um, and they may not stay in solution mm -hmm. because uh, you will reach the sol a solubility limit the solubility limit of certain compounds, for instance. Um, and say, uh, say you have these uh, bigger blue atoms and these smaller uh, dark blue atoms, which could, for instance, be titanium and nitrogen. So titanium is substitutional, nitrogen is interstitial. And uh, as you uh, cool and solidify the material, the, it will form titanium nitride compounds. And these titanium nitride compounds can uh, nucleate and grow at grain boundaries, such as you can see here, or 
inside the grain, inside the matrix of the grains, um, and, and give you intergranular uh, precipitation. So, so the, in other words, elements can be solute, they can form precipitates, and they can be in the matrix, these precipitates, or they can be in the, uh, uh, at, at the uh, at boundaries. And this is an example here, for instance, I was just talking about uh, titanium nitride. So here you see a small titanium nitride uh, uh, precipitate inside uh, the matrix. Hmm? Uh, this is another one, yes. And you can see that uh, more often than not, uh, some precipitates uh, form or nucleated on previous. Uh, form precipitates, such as in this case you can see a little uh, manganese sulfide forming on the titanium nitride. Hmm? And, and we know that titanium nitride gets formed first because it has a lower solubility and the manganese sulfide is nucleated on, on this uh, titanium nitride. So, and then it grows. Hmm? Very important um, in the formation of uh, precipitates, you always have nucleation stage and then a growth stage. Okay. Carbides. Um, what are the important things I want you to remember about them at this stage? Uh, the carbides, if you look at the, uh, that can be formed in steels, um, typically form, are, the carbide formers are typically on the left side of the, uh, the uh, uh, of iron in, in your uh, table of elements. So, and if we look to this left side, the element next to it is manganese. Next to that one is chrome, vanadium, uh, titanium on the same line. And then on the next line, you have moly and niobium on uh, the line below that, and then uh, tungsten. Hmm? Typical uh, carbides that you form yes, in iron. Yes? The most important one, it's probably known to all of you, is this cementite, hmm? Fe3C. That is the, uh, actually, when you uh, have uh, carbon in steels, most of the time it's not present as carbon, it's present as this carbide. Hmm? And there. Um, there are, however, uh, important uh, metastable carbides, which we call uh, transition carbides, which are formed uh, before you form uh, the cementite. Yes. And in particular, so at low temperatures, when carbon, you remember carbon in ferrite has a very low solubility, when it forms, so say, uh, this would be a, a grain of ferrite, yes? And the temperature is very low. The carbon is super saturated, yes? The carbon does not directly form, so if, if certainly if we look at low temperatures, does not directly form cementite. It doesn't form cementite. It fir uh, first forms transition carbides. Yes, transition carbides, um, which are typically referred to as eta carbide, epsilon carbide, and where the the formula for these these carbides are of, for instance, Fe 2.4 carbon. Yes. So that's important. At higher temperatures, the carbon in supersaturation does form cementite directly. 
So there is no uh, intermediate or transition carbide. Hmm? So we'll, 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 um, we'll see some examples of this. Hmm? Manganese forms carbides, but in general, we don't see these carbides in, in steels. Hmm? The reason is um, because uh, in uh, relation to Fe3C, it's not more stable than Fe3C. So what we see is that um, the, uh, the manganese will substitute for iron in the cementite, right? So that's usually what happens. You don't see manganese carbides. Yes? Even for relatively high manganese levels, usually you have a mixed carbide, which is basically cementite, where uh, manganese re has replaced iron in, in, the, in, the, in the carbide lattice. Okay, so, so you don't need to remember these manganese carbides. Um, so what happens now is uh, on the, in this diagram, or on this, uh, in this table, on the right hand side you have the less, relatively less stable carbides, and if you go to the right hand side you get very stable carbides, yes? And there is another thing that happens is that um, if the concentration of the very uh, uh, of, of stable carbide formers such as chrome, moly, and tungsten, when the concentration of these elements is low, yes? you will see that we form mixed carbides. So they're may basically carbides where these elements substitute for each other. Hmm? And uh, an important mixed carbide is M23C6. Hmm? And where the, the M, yes, it can, can be iron, manganese, chrome, tungsten, yes? Say you have a small amount of molybdenum, less than a tenth of a percent, say 0.1 percent of, moly of molybdenum, so not a very high content. It is a strong carbide former relative to cementite, yes? But its concentration is, the concentration of moly is very low. So what does it do? It does not form a separate, um, it's, it's separate carbide like uh, M O two C, it will just be replacing some of the iron atoms in the cementite lattice, hmm? and, and you'll basically, if you analyze this material, you'll just get cementite. Yes. This is important. Um, this happens also for chrome for manganese, as I said, yeah? you always form the cementite and some of these uh, elements are incorporated in the cementite lattice hmm? instead of. However, if we add a few percents of moly, a few percents of uh, two, three percent of chrome, two, three percent of moly, two, three percent of tungsten, then the story is different. Then you will, these elements will be able to uh, form a specific carbide, such as uh, tungsten carbide, moly carbide, chrome carbides. In general, common steels this is the situation. Hmm? The steels where you see chrome, tungsten, moly carbides are specialty steels. Hmm? Specialty steels, I already mentioned one uh, type, for instance, tool steels. Yeah? Um, and when we're thinking about tool steels, of course, you uh, these are steels that you uh, have on a, um, a, a lathe, 
yes, to, to make a, uh, a part, but there can also be uh, the roll of a rolling mill. Yes, there are certain uh, uh, mills which are equipped with tool steels, yeah, tool steels rolls made out of tool steel. Reason why? Because they need to be abrasion resistant, yes? And so they will contain these, these chrome carbides. In, in, in. As we move um, more to the right, we come towards the uh, column four and column five. Titanium, vanadium, niobium. These elements are such strong carbide formers, yes? that it doesn't matter how low their the level of titanium, niobium, or uh, vanadium, they will always form carbides yes? that do not include any iron. Right? So titanium, vanadium, and niobium form carbides, even at very, very low levels of, uh, of um, of titanium, vanadium, and niobium. So uh, we call these compounds like tit TIC, uh, you know, heg compounds. They're stable carbides, and they don't they don't have mixed carbides. So that means they, they don't associate themselves with cementite. That's what I mean. Okay. So let's have a little look here at. Uh, the reason why I mention this is you, you have to imagine in a steel, yes, uh, you always have different alloying elements. And, and uh, so they will interfere with uh, the uh, formation of the cementite, and the basic carbide in these elements. And so let's have a look at what I just described here. Yes? Um, and uh, we will say... Uh, we, will, we will look at what's called the partitioning. Right? So if I have, uh, say, ferrite, yes, and in it I form Fe3C, yes, if I only have iron and carbon, this will be the formula of this compound. Now, if, what happens if, um, if I have a regular alloy? If I have, in addition to I iron, I have manganese and silicon present, yes? How is that element going to partition between uh, the ferrite and the cementite, okay? So, and this is what is shown here. This is the partitioning coefficient at equilibrium between ferrite and cementite for various, for a number of uh, alloying elements. So you, this is the, X is the a concentration of the element in the cementite divided by the concentration of that element in the matrix. Yeah? Okay. So what we see is that elements silicon, cobalt, nickel, they have they're not carbide formers as such. Yes. So they're um, the, the, the amount of uh, these elements in the carbide will be uh, very low, yeah? close to non-existence, close to zero. Mm -hmm. However, the more we move to from these no carbide forming elements to the very strong carbide forming elements, we see that this ratio increases. Right? Mm -hmm. For instance, here, 10. It means that if you have manganese, yes, the manganese uh, elements such as chrome, yes, if you uh, would give a steel the opportunity to reach its equilibrium state, you would see a lot, a strong partitioning of the manganese into the cementite. Yes. Now I want to point out that these are equilibrium partitioning coefficients. In steels, we process the materials relatively rapidly. So very often, uh, we, we're never in thermodynamic equilibrium. So 
uh, you may not observe this kind of partitioning coefficients if in your own research, right? But the tendency to partition is definitely there. Okay, this, this is an example here, yes? You can see this is the partitioning coefficient partitioning coefficient as a function of the temperature, yes? Um, what you basically uh, measure is what is the difference between the, uh, the ratio of the uh, element, in this case the uh, chromium, yes? In the matrix and in the cementite and in the matrix. And you see, of course, when it's the same, the partitioning is one. There's no, par yes, the, the partitioning coefficient is one. Yes? And you can see that the higher, at the, the higher temperature I form the cementite, you see that the amount of chrome in the cementite increases. Yes? And if I wait long enough, yes, so if I, at, at 700, I wait for one hour, the chrome content increases fivefold. I wait 10 hours, 15 fold, right? So there is a very strong tendency for chrome to partition to the carbide. And you can see it here, again, function of time. This case, it's a, the manganese partitioning you're looking at. You see that uh, if you wait long enough at 642, you see the manganese content in the carbide increasing until it reaches its equilibrium. If you had done it at a higher temperature, 672, you would see an increase in the amount of manganese. So the manganese will have a tendency to go also into the, the cementite. Now you'll say, well, okay, you know, that's good to know, you know, that's uh, uh, not unexpected. It does have an impact on the uh, um, technology. Hmm? I'll give you an example, and which we will discuss in more detail uh, later. But say um, uh, you have wire products, a wire product. This is a wire product, just in case. It was the wire product. The wire products are very often most. Uh, the, the largest tonnage of wire products are what we call perlitic steels. Yes. And they have large amounts of uh, cementite that is present as perlite. Hmm? Um, the, one of the first things we do with the wire products is spherodizing them. We don't like the, uh, the lamellar structure of perlite when we're processing wire products. For instance, if we want to make ball bearings with uh, wire steel, yeah, that's how you make ball bearings. With, you start with wire steel. Uh, the first step you have to do is being able to make balls out of these uh, wires. So uh, you, you have to turn the cementite into small spherical cementite. Yeah? Now, the partitioning of these elements to the cementite has a very big impact on the thermal treatment you have to give to these steels to get the cementite to go from a lamellar structure to spherical structure. And in particular, the chromium, because uh, chrome is added to uh, ball bearing steels to control the transformation because um, you need to have very hard ball bearings, so you're going to make martensite out of them eventually, after you've made balls, yes? Um, and so you add chrome. But the chrome, when you produce the wire, will be in your cementite, yes? And have a big impact on the way and, uh, the, and the kinetics of the spherodization. Okay? Good. So let's now, um, now that we, we mentioned the word transformation, let's look at a, a number of elements 
that at this stage in the course you should kind of have your uh, clear mindset about uh, why they're in the steels and what they do to steels. And so first of all we'll talk uh, about uh, manganese. So what does manganese do? Well, um, always look at phase diagrams, yes? Simple phase diagrams to discover what an element, what the impact is of an element. You see the iron carbon diagram and superposed on it, yes? are what we call isoplets. These are pseudo iron carbon diagrams where the level, there is a third dimension, yes, uh, where, where you change the manganese content. Yes. So it's basically a section through a 3D uh, phase diagram, yes, and the section at 1% manganese is shown superposed on the iron carbon diagram, 2% manganese. And what you see is the austenite domain expands. That, is, that means that manganese is an austenite stabilizer or uh, element, yes. And you also see the, uh, this eutectoid point, yes, yes, uh, go, the, the composition going towards the left and the temperature going down. Hmm? Just to remind you, uh, in the iron carbon diagram, excuse me, in the iron carbon diagram, uh, so if this is gamma field, alpha plus gamma, yes. Uh, this is the temperature, of course, and this is the carbon content. Um, we, we call this line in the, in the phase diagram the uh, A3 line, AE3 line. Right? So that's the, that's the equilibrium uh, uh, the, the line which tells me where the transformation starts. Yes? And, and, and this line here, AE1. And EE uh, stands for equilibrium. Yeah. All, all the points, it's uh, um, tradition to, uh, you, you just don't describe this line, you just call it the A3 line. Hmm? Um, right. Um, so th this, this, this we call the A3 line, A3 line. This line here is the line where you, you start forming cementite out of the, for those who don't see, this is gamma plus uh, cementite uh, phase, uh, field, yes? Uh, and this, so this line, line is called a ECM, yeah? Right, and so when we add small amounts of alloying elements, and that's typically what we do in steel, these lines will shift up and down, left and right, and uh, we can still refer, although it's not perfectly correct from a thermodynamic point of view, we can still look at them at, at, uh, at an iron carbon diagram uh, when, when we add alloying elements. Um, in order to see trends. Um, right, so manganese is from looking at uh, the data on the slide is an austenite <coughs> stabilizer. That's always the first thing you do. The second thing you do is you have a look at transformation curves, yes? Because that will tell you uh, something about um, what you can expect when you add uh, manganese. So first of all, um, we, we if you, if you look at the transformation uh, data, yes, you, you have to kind of make a choice about what composition you're going to use, namely what is going to be your carbon level and what's going to be your manganese level. So what we, what we do in this case, we choose this, the eutectoid uh, carbon level. Hmm? So, and, and we look at the transformation, and uh, as you know, uh, for the transformation, we get a C curve, 
yes? The C curve, if there is no manganese. If we add manganese, we see that this C curve for the start of transformation uh, moves to the left and moves down. Um, the fact that it moves down shouldn't come as a surprise because I can see that as we add manganese, the AE3 line moves down, yes? And of course, the transformation or the formation of the cementite can only start below AE1 temperature, right? So that's why the, uh, the C curve moves down. It moves down because uh, 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 manganese is an austenite stabilizer. However, I can also see that the curve moves, the nose of the curve moves to the right. Hmm? So, um, in general, and I'll come to this in, uh, discuss this in more detail uh, later on, is we say an element that does this increases the hardenability of steel. Hmm? And hardenability, can, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll talk about this uh, coming lectures, hardenability is how easy, means how easy is it to make martensite, basically. Hmm? Do I need huge cooling rates to make martensite, or can I make martensite with relatively mild cooling rates? Hmm? Whenever you move transformation nodes for instance, in this case, for uh, uh, the formation of perlite, because the transformation here, as you go through this temperature, is the, the perlite formation, uh, you, you will make the steel more hardenable. Because you, the, the range of times and temperatures where you can keep the austenite stable as you cool it, Yes, is increased. <coughs> okay, so we had one element is uh, started with manganese. Second element is silicon. That is important. You should know a few things about silicon. Silicon, in contrast to the uh, the manganese we just saw, is a an austenite. is is not an austenite stabilizer, but a ferrite stabilizer. So it stab stabilizes ferrite, yes? So now, if we look at the, uh, the uh, perlite formation, yes, the perlite formation kinetics, that, that is this here, yes? As we add silicon, what we see is that it appears, certainly at, this, at the higher temperatures, that silicon slightly increases the AE1 temperature and accelerates the transformation. And the reason is it happens to the reverse of the manganese. The reason is because silicon stabilizes ferrite. So it will uh, accelerate the uh, ferrite formation and it will accelerate this during perlite formation, that is here. Yeah. And when you form proeutectoid uh, ferrite. Proeutectoid ferrite is the ferrite you form when you cool austenite into a past the AE3 lock. Okay. There is, however, something important you should know about silicon. Yes, um, and um, and uh, we we very often say that silicon is a graphitizing element. You, you know, graphite is basically carbon, right? Uh, uh, and uh, graphitizing means that. In the presence of silicon, yes, cementite will not be formed. 
or the tendency to form cementite will be reduced. There are two reasons for this. Yes? First is the partitioning of silicon between the matrix and the cementite. What do we know about that? Well, we know that the partitioning coefficient is very, very low. In other words, silicon does not dissolve in cementite. So the solubility of silicon in cementite is nil mm -hmm. for all practical purposes. Okay, that doesn't mean that cementite, the, 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 the formation and growth of cementite should be suppressed. So there is an other effect that comes into play, and that effect is the fact that silicon increases the activity of carbon in ferrite considerably. Okay, so let's imagine we have a particle, a small particle of cementite is formed, yes? And you have uh, silicon in your steel, okay? So around here you have uh, ferrite, okay? So what happens is the silicon gets pushed out of the area where the cementite is forming, right? So it goes this way, silicon goes away. It partitions, yeah. it partitions to the ferrite. Right, what happens to the carbon? Well, the carbon flows flows to the, the cementite. Hmm? High carbon, the ca carbon concentration is very high, so it goes into. So the, if I would plot the uh, carbon content around the particle, it goes like this. This is carbon content as a function of the distance. Hmm? Carbon concentration. And I get a uh, very familiar diffusion profile around the cementite. Um, now, it is, you know that diffusion, diffusion, the flux of atoms is proportional to, of course, the diffusivity of an element, but also to the uh, diffusion profile. So, so, so this here is this. It's a diffusion profile around the particle. That's actually what pumps the, the carbon to the, to the particle, right? Okay. So what, how does silicon work? Well, very simply, this is actually not correct, 100%. What, what uh, drives the diffusion is the uh, free energy <laughs> difference, yes? And the free energy... Uh, so it's not the, it's the activity of carbon that is important. And this is where silicon comes in. As I expel silicon from this area, I have a high silicon level here in this region. Yes. And this may be the carbon content, but the carbon activity the activity of carbon does not have a slope, a, a downward slope. It has an upward slope. So, so cementite cannot grow. Yes? Of course, if you're clever, you will see that eventually the silicon has to diffuse into the ferrite, yes? And, and this effect will, is not everlasting, right? So whether or not you use this to suppress uh, uh, cementite formation or not depends very much on temperatures at which you do this and, and the times that you wait. 
but it's exploited uh, very often. So silicon cannot go in the cementite. It enriches at this interface. It increases the activity. So the carbon diffusion is basically stopped, and I don't get growth of the um, uh, of the carbonate. Oh, sorry. I, let's go back one slide. Yeah. Um, so you see elements that do this. Um, phosphorus does this. Also, uh, to a certain extent, aluminum also. So silicon is not the only element that uh, does that. Mm -hmm. And because it suppresses cementite formation, we, uh, it promotes in high carbon uh, alloys, such as uh, cast iron, it promotes the formation of graphite. Yeah? And that's why in cast irons, uh, you always find silicon, and that's why we call it silicon a graphitizing element because it suppresses formation of uh, we had uh, formation of cement excuse me we had uh, elements uh, other elements uh, and I want to discuss four other elements uh, because they'll be uh, discussed a lot in uh, as, as we talk about different uh, steels um, Chromium. Chromium is an element, uh, of course, uh, chromium is the element in stainless steels, but we're not talking about 10 or 12 percent of chromium. We're talking about a uh, few percent or even less of chromium. And what we see is that uh, chromium is a ferrite stabilizing element, not very strong. We can see it tends to lift the AE1 temperature, just as silicon did. So it's definitely uh, uh, a ferrite stabilizer. It also moves the um, eutectoid composition to uh, the left. Uh, but what it's basically used for is the impact it has on the transformations. Yes, In particular, the ferrite formation and the bainite formation. So, so, uh, so here, this, this uh, pseudo-binary diagram here shows that uh, uh, the AE1 temperature goes up, so it's a ferrite stabilizer. And I have some enlargements here of this uh, uh, diagram here, transformation diagram. So let's have a look at a... Uh, CCT diagram for a steel, an engineering steel, 0.4 carbon, and it's, um, it doesn't have molybdenum in it. So basically uh, tells me uh, that, uh, that this is the um, transformation, um, transformation behavior of this material. Just in case you don't know or don't remember uh, how this type of diagram works, it's a continuous cooling diagram, yes. Um, you, to use it, you, you need to decide for yourself a cooling rate, yes. So a cooling rate basically means temperature as a function of time. Yeah? And here you also have temperature as a function of time. So you have to decide what cooling rate are we talking about. Hmm? So, okay. so um, say this cooling rate, hmm? this, is, this would be temperature plot as a function of time. When I use this data and I put it in a C CCT diagram, I find curves. Why do I find curves? Because it's a log. It's the log of time, right? Okay. And so you plot this, your line here, and for instance, if I, uh, it crosses these uh, two lines here, uh, the top lines which say ferrite perlite. It just means that uh, when I hit, for instance, when I start 900 degrees C and I, I arrive at 
100 seconds, uh, I will hit this line. And it's, this says, at this time, you initiate the formation of ferrite and perlite. Yes? And here it starts, and here this transformation stops. Yes? That's basically what it says. Yeah? And if nothing else happens, that means that at room temperature, I will see ferrite and perlite. Say I have a very high cooling rate, yes? So again, I get a, C, a, a curved line that goes like this. And in this case, I, I cross this line here. It means that nothing happens until I hit this temperature and I form martensite. Basically, um, the CCD diagram is just a way to tell you, well, somebody looked at this microstructure at different cooling rates, this particular composition, and uh, they packed all the knowledge they had about the transformation and the microstructures into this single diagram, yes? There's, because there's, you can extract a lot of interesting science from this diagram, but for a practitioner, steel practitioner, it's basically something that will you know, tell him, you know, what what he has to do if he wants to have a certain microstructure. Okay, so but let's say now that we use this, take the same steel, yes, and because we're not happy about the, the transformation behavior, and we add uh, <coughs> molybdenum, well, this will be the difference. The difference is I can see that the uh, perlite ferrite transformation is pushed back and the bainite transformation range is pushed, is enhanced, goes faster. Okay, so this is what, and this is what the effect is, yes, is you suppress ferrite stable uh, transformation and you expand the bainite transformation. So it basically means um, you, stable, you, 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 uh, you uh, make it easier to obtain bainitic microstructures in, for this particular steel, right? There's something um, interesting that I just want to uh, share with you because um, we were talking about uh, cementite, yes? Uh, the way the uh, partitioning works when you do transformations at different temperatures. Okay. Yeah. Um, and in particular, the, w the, the difference in the partitioning of alloying elements, and here in particular uh, chrome, uh, between the cementite and the ferrite, um, in these two uh, transformation rate in the perlite transformation rate and in the bainite transformation. So this is shown here. If I have uh, a carbon steel with 1.4 percent of chrome, uh, the this time I'm not showing you a CCT diagram, but a TTT diagram. So this one is a, a diagram which allows you to predict what you will have in terms of transformations and microstructure if you do isothermal uh, transformation, an isothermal hold, yes? Uh, now, if you're in steel research, you love to do isothermal holds because it simplifies the science. Um, in technology, you very, you very almost never do isothermal holds, yes? Um, but anyway, so in this case, it's an isothermal hold, and uh, <coughs> we have two distinct transformations. That is the, the perlite transformation and the austenite, and it, excuse me, the austenite to bainite transformation. And the steel has about 0.8 percent of carbon. That's near eutectoid composition, and you look at how the Chromium distributes itself between the, uh, the cementite and the ferrite. 
So this is the partitioning coefficient now. It's, it's horizontal. And this is the, the temperature. You see that when we form perlite at high temperature, the partitioning is very high. Hmm? This is the equilibrium partitioning data. This is the uh, experimental partitioning data. But as you reduce the temperature, yes, the partitioning of the chromium to the cementite is much reduced. Yes. And if we look at bainite, there is no partitioning. And the reason is basically that in order to partition, yes, there has to be a driving force for partitioning, so it's, that is there, but the element, chromium, also has to have the ability to diffuse, yes? And you can basically say, uh, as a steel person, practical, from a practical point of view, is that below 550, 550, you can basically assume that interstitial, uh, substitutional elements do not diffuse anymore. Yes. And that is why in the carbides you form in bainite, there is no partitioning of the chromium because the chromium is basically frozen in the lattice. It doesn't diffuse anymore. Carbon still diffuses. Interstitial elements can still diffuse. Yeah. So that's one of the big differences between uh, perlite and bainite formation is in the case of a perlite formation, you do have, uh, certainly at the higher end of perlite formation, you do have partitioning of uh, the chromium in this case. In the bainite uh, transformation range, no partitioning. And I have a few minutes to uh, say uh, some words about molybdenum. Molybdenum is also an element, very commonly added to steels, and very often in conjunction with chromium, because it has an impact on the transformation kinetics. And the best way to illustrate this, I, you, you can see here what it does to the um, uh, ferrite and perlite transformation. You see that it, it pushes them back, so it's, it suppresses the uh, uh, ferrite and perlite transformation. And let's see what it looks like in a, uh, an engineering steel. Again, we have 0.4 carbon steel. Yes, This is a transformation situation without molybdenum. If we add molybdenum, you see an impressive sup, sup, um, um, suppression of the ferrite and perlite transformation. So you can see now that if you, if you want to have benetic microstructure, yes, uh, molybdenum allows you to do this very easily because uh, at relatively uh, easy cooling rates you have uh, um, you form bainite. Even if your cooling rates are slow, yes, you still can form bainite. Yes. So, bainitic steels, we like to have molybdenum. Yes. So the consequence of this is, you will. N we were talking about. Uh, uh, this wi wire steel that uh, is used to make ball bearings, for instance, right? You will never add molybdenum to a steel like this because you want perlite to form, right? So, uh, good. So, um, when we uh, reconvene on Monday morning, we will, next week, we will be uh, discussing two more elements uh, that have a very peculiar 
uh, and very pronounced uh, behavior in steels, and we will, and those are boron and niobium, and um, and you will see that here also you can you can use these additions, very small additions by the way, yes, to uh, to get very large in, to have a very large impact on the on the properties and microstructures. See you then. <laughs>